It's time to get your checking account to zero with free checking from PenFed. That's zero ATM fees, zero balance requirements, and zero time spent waiting for your paycheck to direct deposit because you can receive it up to two days early. Open your account with just $25 and see how big zero can be. Apply online today at PenFed.org slash free checking. Early direct deposit eligibility may vary between pay periods and timing of payers' funding. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Bear Boat Alaska, a pure DIY hunting game with one of their 37-foot adventure yachts. You and five of your friends can hunt, fish, set crab pots, shrimp pots, and take DIY to the next level. Bear Boat Alaska is locally owned by a Ketchikan resident who lives here year-round. Call Larry at 907-617-4542 or go to bearboatalaska.com. That's B A R E both alaska.com and tell larry you heard about it on this podcast let's get rolling so uh brad brooks welcome back to the podcast thanks for being on here again good to see you jeff so uh you are the owner of our golly uh, you make uh, good films on youtube uh, you're maker of excellent knives game bags things like that but i'm not i don't your, your business model isn't great because you make quality items, which is uh, different than my cell phone that uh, is self-destructing, my laptop and everything else. You didn't get the memo about uh, disposable consumables being the way to go? I did not get that memo. <laughs> I'm a, you, well, you know me well enough at this point. You know, I, I, I eschew disposable items. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you, we've been on uh, a couple times together. We've talked about kind of hunts in general. Another one we talked about uh, gear specifically, but I want to talk about films. I don't know why the last couple of months I've been really into outdoor films and more rather just watching them, kind of analyzing what I like and what I don't like about them. Um, mm. So I just kind of wanted to pick your brain about how you decide um, and how you determine w- what your films are going to be. So first of all, uh, with uh, – influences what did you watch growing up is there someone or some show that you thought man this has really done well i'm not going to try to copy it but this really influenced me as far as shots or as far as length um anything oh yeah good question um i watched uh, as a real young kid i uh, i think it was espn that used to have a lot of uh fishing fishing shows so do you remember there was a show called walker's cake chronicles Mm-hmm. Does, that ever, does that ring a bell at all? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm blanking on the guy's name now, but I can remember the cine- the cinematography and the quality of that show was very different than a lot of things that were on uh, hunting and fishing media that, that I used to love watching. It was it was less of like the shoot 'em up, let's you know you know shoot a fenced in kind of buck type. Uh, program which i think is, is pretty common in the hunting world and they really focused on really really interesting stories about really interesting places and every time i have vivid memories of watching that show and just being like man i really want to go check out that place so i i don't know that i've ever thought about how influential like that show and there are probably some others as well um were on me, but that connection to place, which is a lot of what we do now, was always so much more interesting and alluring to me as a consumer of media, even mm-hmm. as a young, young kid. Um, i trying to think what else I watched. I didn't, man, at that point in time, it was all, you know, I just turned, I just turned 40, Jeff. So when I was, when I was young, when I was a kid, there wasn't, I mean, the internet wasn't a thing. Mm-hmm. You couldn't go on YouTube and watch anything. It was all on cable news TV. We didn't have, I'm not even sure if the sports news channel was around, but if it, if it was, my parents, you know, weren't paying for it. We had basic cable. And so that really relegated you to, I think it was ESPN was the channel that showed most of, and it was, I think it was Saturday morning. You could watch uh, Jimmy Houston. Uh, not Jimmy Houston. Was it Jimmy Houston. Who's the guy who used to kiss the bass? Um, with the Tennessee hat. Yeah. Um, I don't know who you're Not talking Jimmy. about. He's he's an he's an icon in uh he's in bass icon. fishing and in fishing yeah. and in fishing shows. I can't think of his name though. Yeah, um, but he's he was entertaining. The thing I always liked about him was just how, what a what a character he was. 
and he, I didn't, I mean, I, I fished, uh, for bass a little bit growing up, uh, but I wasn't, it wasn't like my sole purpose in life. Uh, I was like, oh man, I want to catch bass. I did have dreams of being a professional bass fisherman when I was really young, probably because of him, but he was a really interesting person and a really interesting character. And so I think both of those things, both the Walker's Cave Chronicles, the, the connection to place, uh, Flip, that was the guy's name from Walker's Cave Chronicles, Flip. Like you know, his last name, um, but both of those things, so connection to place and then people, are what make a good piece of you know, content that I was really interested in. Yeah, I, I think it's an important distinction. I'm not sure if you meant it intentionally, but a person rather than a host. I think sometimes when it's a host of a show, it becomes about the host, and sometimes some shows look like it's they're casting this character rather than this actual person. And Bill Dance is the guy with uh, with the Tennessee hat. And um, he he seems like the type of, of uncle or grandfather who would kind of ham it up. That just seemed like who he is. And so it was yeah. just him being him, and it was a cool show. And, yeah, he was a host of a show. Um, but I think that's an important uh, important thing to keep in, keep in mind. So when you started shooting, what type of person did you want to be or, like, your protagonist in a story? How did you develop yourself or how did you think, all right, well, I don't really feel comfortable doing, you know, if, camera in my own face but i have to do it for the show this is the look that i want i'm going to do some some voiceovers too um and i'm going to write them out first or i'm just going to kind of wing it uh, how do you decide uh, how you integrated yourself into your films oh gosh um you can tell this all makes you very uncomfortable heaters i'm throwing <laughs> heaters man you know i know you are i know i it it to be super honest it makes me really uncomfortable thinking about it because it i I, I didn't really approach it from the standpoint of um, thinking about how do how do I want to come across or how do I want my personality to come across. It was it just is what it is. Um, I I never really intended for to to be a focal point in all of our content. It was more that I had a an idea of what I wanted to, the stories that I wanted to tell. And I didn't know if people, anybody would care or like them. And it was never about me. It was about the, the focal point, especially for our early work was about me wanting to tell a story that I thought was interesting from my own perspective. And I don't know how to have somebody else do that. It's really hard to hand that off to somebody to articulate the type of story that you're trying to tell. So I didn't know, I mean, there were no other options maybe is the best way to explain it, Jeff. Um, you know, only you, Jeff Lund can tell your story. And I feel like I can tell my story and other people can tell their stories, but it wasn't a conscious decision around trying to tell a story and create a character. I think people um, might be like, incredibly disappointed when they meet me in person to realize like what you see is what you get what you see on film is literally the exact same way i am like there's no difference mm-hmm. it's the same thing it's not a facade there's no, i'm not, you know i'm not cool in real life um i'm as mundane as i am in real life as i am in our, in our content um so one of the same yeah i think that's an important thing too i it, and just because i don't like something doesn't mean that it's bad but i think the people who and I don't know exactly what it is, but there's just a feeling you get some people um, are out there attempting to look authentic and attempting to look that like the type of person who doesn't like the camera, but you can sense that they do. Um, and I don't know what it is. And again, I am not here to, to talk trash about anybody in, in specifically, but I think there's just a different feeling. I think that the appeal of, of you and, and Corey Jacobson and, and guys like that are they almost – look reluctant reluctant but they're excited to tell the story and i think that's one of the that's a real authenticity um that you don't get uh if you're just trying to create a character or trying to get views you're trying to sell products so that's uh that's a pretty that's a pretty good thing well that's a high compliment coming from you i appreciate that um it is really hard to um i i think that authenticity comes across you know when you're when you're in uh, watching something I try, we, I try to be just as normal as, as I possibly can because I don't know, I don't know how to act. I'm not an actor, <laughs> uh, so I wouldn't know what to do if I was trying to put on a, 
uh, of the sauce. Um, I think anytime we're creating a piece of content, I try and just make it as like normal and relatable to your average person as possible. Mm -hmm. And I want people to get a sense that they are along for the ride with us or they're on the trip with us. So one of the things I've heard from, from the self filming that I do is people like that. They feel like they're there with me. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting thing because when I'm, when you're by yourself or especially for extended periods of time, um, the camera, it does feel like even though you're talking to nothing, there's no response. There's no, like when you talk to a person, you, can, you know, they can talk back to you. When you're talking to a camera, it's just, it's just an inanimate object, right? But it does feel as though you are talking to somebody else. And I try and, uh, treat it as such, right? So there's a, there's a comfort <laughs> for me that comes. It feels like the camera is my, my hunting buddy out there. And it's annoying to film yourself hunting, uh, to be totally honest about it. It's not easy or necessarily that much fun, but I do enjoy telling the story about a hunt or a place that I, that is important to me. And when other people can relate to that, that's to me that I, I get fulfillment in that or I find fulfillment in that. Um, so. Mm -hmm. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. I was hesitant about having to get a new phone and a new phone number, but with Mint, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone and your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or for a family, and at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash waypoint. That is mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Two of the films that I like the most, my wife, um, she's pretty, I wouldn't say judgmental, uh, I wouldn't even say critical, but she knows what she likes and she's not afraid to say, Hey, I don't, I like this or I don't like this, yeah, but she really liked right, your, um, right. the hunting, the wild places. You did uh, an episode in the Frank and then uh, Yellowstone too. You yeah. uh, incorporated more of the, uh, the history of that. So you can get a better sense of rather than just me extracting a resource from this area, you gave in some of the, uh, some of the background of it. Um, how did the, ha Telling the story of a place, how important is the, is that for, for you to not just say, hey, this is where I'm hunting, this is also the background, and this is why it still exists the way it does? The, um, I mean, we, let me back up here. We got in, I got into filmmaking because I was more interested in telling stories about places than, uh, than anything else, because that connection to place is what I've always uh, appreciated about hunting. And I, I usually will tell people like there is I guarantee you if you ask people to think about their favorite place that they have hunted, grew up hunting or like to hunt in, almost everybody like instantaneously is going to say like they're going to their mind is going to go directly to their favorite place. So connection to place is a part of hunting. Connection to many places is a part of hunting for a lot of people. So yeah, for me, it's it's incredibly important. Connection to wild wilderness, big wild country is what I love the most. And that's what is the most important to me and why we started the filmmaking. Um, to be honest with you, when we made that Frank film, it was, I thought it was going to be more controversial than it was because the idea of setting aside large tracts of land to not be developed, set aside as wilderness, you know, it, it can be controversial at times. I think it's really important. I think it's important for hunting. 
it's important to me personally. Um, and I expected that film, I expected to hear from people that were going to have a different opinion than I do. Um, I had heard from zero people, like zero. <laughs> it, it shocked me with how many views that film has. Um, the, you know, the other thing that sh- that's interesting about that film is I, I wanted to tell, so I, I knew Frank Church. Uh, if you watch that film, Frank Church is a senator from Idaho who uh, helped uh, uh, designate the Frank Church River, River of No Return Wilderness, which is an iconic wilderness in the lower 48. I knew his wife, uh, his widow, or uh, Bethine Church. She was uh, a powerful, powerful person. And Frank was a powerful person. I didn't know him, um, but I knew the story of him. And I wanted people to understand that these things don't happen by accident. Nothing, none of the places that we have, these wild places, happen by default or by accident. And I really wanted to make sure that was understood, that people understood that, that you have these really influential people in history, in our history, that have worked to protect places. And that's happening today too, right? And these things are controversial when they're, they're happening. The designation of the Central Idaho Wilderness Act, which then became the Frank Church Wilderness, was a hot topic in its day. Real strong opinions on both sides of that issue. Today, nobody cares. Mm. For the most part, everyone's just like, glad we got it. Mm-hmm. But in the moment, it, it's a real hot topic. There are parallels about that with our modern day life. And I don't know that anybody makes that leap, but I hope they do. That was a hope with the film that people would understand that conservation uh, is about the future and it's about, you know, taking care of what you got today for the future. Um, and we tried to do that while telling the story of Frank uh, Church as a person. Um, so I still get emotional when I think about it because it's um, the only thing I took shit for was uh, I took shit for people saying for me getting emotional about Frank Church. I have zero tolerance for that, though. I'm like. Yeah, but there's definitely a macho thing in our culture. Mm. So, yeah, there's a whole bunch of pre-scripted things that we can say about gratitude, but then there's actual gratitude and being so thankful for this, you know, to get that shot at the very end or the the hashtag blessed on the Instagram posts. Like it's like, oh yeah, I am, but it's it's the most readily available for us. Um, yeah, so I think that gratitude and just being really appreciative of those experiences is something that's important. Uh, speaking of gratitude, that Yellowstone one, I've read, I've read a couple of books about the Yellowstone and how unbelievably close we were to losing bison and how Yellowstone ended up being this massive historical last stand for, I think that's the name of the book that I read too, um, for some of these species because it was that take, take, take mentality and had no idea about what the consequences were, had no idea of the, the scope of slaughter Um and then also there was a, an awareness of the slaughter and, and what the purpose was for, um, but just how close things were so long ago from, from us losing um, uh, the resources. It was, that was, it's pretty crazy. And, and to appreciate Yellowstone, you have to kind of know that background. Otherwise it's a really cool place to go and see, but the history just makes it, it you just have to know it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most people don't realize that most of our modern day elk populations across the lower 48 come from Yellowstone. Probably the elk that you have on some of the islands up in Alaska are descendants of Yellowstone herds. Um, there's probably somebody out there listening to me who's going to correct me on some of this, but you know, there are, there are plenty of records of elk being trucked by, you know, truck taken by train to repopulate areas where they had been almost extirpated locally. And so Yellowstone is, you know, I, I have conflicting feelings about Yellowstone. You're right. It's like, the park system is a bit of an amusement park type approach to conservation. Like it's kind of silly in some ways, but you have to respect and appreciate it for what it did and what it continues to do. And so there's this, I have like mixed feelings about it. Do I love going to a crowded national park? Like, no, absolutely not. It's anathema to everything that I like about <laughs> recreating. It's like, I like getting away from people, not going to hordes of people. But it's, it's phenomenal for what it did. The, the history of Yellowstone cannot be denied for what it has done for modern day hunting opportunities. If you hunt elk, you should be thanking the Yellowstone National Park designation, frankly. Um, which is interesting, right? Because you can't hunt in parks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in most parks. Yeah. So this duality, but the history is, is quite fascinating. 
Um, and there's a lot of land, like we talked about in the film, that's outside of the park, but that is a part of that ecosystem that you can hunt in and that is still, you know, you can hunt it. It's a part of the conservation success story of that place. And it is remarkable that in the United States, we were able to have the forethought and we were lucky to have people like Teddy Roosevelt. Had we not had an interesting thought experiment is to think about what what, had, what would have happened if Teddy Roosevelt wasn't president at that time. Mm-hmm. I don't know what our modern day hunting world would look like had he not been around at that time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's anyways, this is, <laughs> this is, these are the things that I think about, Jeff. No, I, I think uh, it ha- at some point uh, for many hunters, you, I don't want to say mature into this because it implies maybe that when you start off, you don't know anything, but you really don't kind of know anything. You kind of, this is a, a cool thing to do. And then you kind of look at the entire scope. Um, and these sort of things are, are popping up in Alaska to a somewhat different degree because we've established these systems and what we're going to protect. We're protecting land, but with the, the, the scale of resources that we need and then the, the dependency of, of people on those resources, it's, um, it's difficult because you don't have opportunities for people to just get new jobs. If the, if the timber industry goes out like it did in some of these okay. Southeast Alaska areas, it's, so it's like, all right, well, you know, we, we, we get, have to keep the habitat 100% for sure. Um, but at the same time, you know, what about the families who can't just drive and commute to a new community for a new job? They're on a different island. And if the industry goes out, who's going to move in? So if you're trying to sell your house, who are you going to sell it to? And so you don't have the money to then move your family to a new location for the new job. So it's super, super complex. Um, and yeah, I mean, no answers here at, at all, but uh, just... We want to preserve these things, but also make it uh, beneficial. So it's hard to just be in, in one camp. It's that, that middle line is just, I, and I'm glad I don't have to make those decisions as well. I'll never be a politician. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think that, uh, you know, I, I certainly, I'm, I'm a pragmatist at heart and I think you can have, you can have both things, right? It's not, life is not an all or nothing conservation and is not an all or nothing. Um, I don't, I don't believe in extremes as a person. Um, I think you could have, you know, we all use resources. If you, if you, you know, use toilet paper or, or a phone, right? These are all like mm-hmm. there's minerals and all these things. There's, there's natural resources and all these things. To me, the, the false, uh, reality that gets put up oftentimes by people is like, you can have one or the other, but you mm-hmm. can't have both. And I just don't buy that. I think you can have both. And I think you can do, you can have, you know, not to make this a political thing, but I think you can. You can do both and you can, you can conserve species. You can have good fish habitat in Southeast Alaska and a healthy timber industry. I don't think those two things are necessarily have to be incompatible. Mm-hmm. Um, that might be naive. I think some people say that's naive. I say you're just not trying hard enough if you can't figure out how to make those, those two things coexist. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Well, there, we've seen some shifts. Um, one of the uh, Sea Alaska Native Corporations, they've shifted from uh, a lot of timber, which was their, their mega uh, moneymaker in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, was logging. And now they've shifted a lot to, uh, to kelp. Um, and so just, you know, emerging industries, aquaculture is, is a great way to pivot. So like you said, it doesn't have to be one or the other. And yeah, those extremes are so funny because on the one side, um, you want to kill all the caribou and just shoot them with oil and the other extreme is, you know, you're supporting cobalt mines and child slavery because you want electric batteries. It's like, no, no, that's not, those don't, <laughs> those aren't the two options, man. There's, there's a lot of things in the middle here, a lot of things that can be discussed, but, uh, middle. So, yeah. uh, anyway, anyway yeah, and I'm, I don't mean to get political on you. So no, I'm no, just thinking, no. Like, it's a, the world that happens in the middle and there's a lot of nuance and I, uh, extremes are frustrating thing mm-hmm. for, I think people just need to like listen to each other and really like, try and figure out, uh, you know, solutions to these complex problems rather than take some sort of, you know, political stand on them. Yeah. There's a lot of practical solutions. So, anyways. So when you are, when, when you are making a film, this is a segue out of it, but still somewhat related. When you are making a film about an area, how much, I guess, responsibility maybe do you feel to provide at least a little bit of a context before you kind of move on. So I'm going to, I'm going to touch on this briefly just so people kind of know, or I don't even want to get into it. I mean, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to, to go into any sort of the politics, but how much of that context do you, do you 
add to your your films or feel obligated to add to your films when you uh what do you mean by sorry can you say a little bit more about that so if um if you're, you're you're telling a story of a place, and if that place is being threatened by something, or it has a fragile ecosystem, or or something like that, how much of that do, do you feel obligated to incorporate into your films as part of the story of the place? I try really hard not to get political about things and just present the facts about uh, something. I don't ever want us or me or our brand to be associated as a, a, a taking a side. And I feel like so much of our today's world is about taking sides. Mm -hmm. I think that most people, no, most people, I would say most hunters identify as conservationists. And that is something that, that binds us um, as hunters. We care about the resources and the places that we hunt. And this has come back to the importance of place to me. Um, uh, I don't. I don't know that I would frame it as feeling responsibility so much as it is. I want people to be aware as much as they can about the issues that are happening in some of the places around the, <laughs> around the, the country, or maybe around the globe. Um, I don't. I, we try really hard, and I think you see this in the Frank film, is that we, I don't want people to feel as though they're being lectured to mm. ever. I don't like being lectured to, and I don't, nobody likes being lectured to. Um, I think you can talk about the values of a place simply by talking about the values of a place and let people come to their own conclusion about how they feel about the issues, the things that may affect those values. So for an example, um, if I'm, if, you know, if we're making a film that is about the Yellowstone country or the Sky Islands in Arizona, a good example, um, we didn't we didn't go into great detail about habitat fragmentation in the sky islands, but it's a massive issue. It's a huge issue. Um, but I didn't, we didn't want to make it a political film. I'm not trying to make a political mm -hmm. film. So if people come away from watching these films and it influences <laughs> their, their opinion on, on some of the conservation issues, like zero to, you know, or not at all, that's fine. Some people might come to a different conclusion, and I, I don't want to preordain how people, the impression that they come away with when they watch one of our pieces of content. I want them to take away from it what they want. That's intentional. And if you, if we're very conscious that if we try and get too, uh, lectury or preachy, which I don't, I will, will never do, that there is a potential side effect to that. The same time, let me, so I say that. Um, so I feel some responsibility, but I also want people to take away from what they want. We are a mission driven company. So we, yes, we make the, the gear side of our business. That's our business, right? But the storytelling side of our business, we, that is a something we do because we care about it. We're not just, we're not, a, we don't fit neatly into a box or our company or our brand, as you said. And so I'm not afraid to tell a story, uh, that has, things that might upset people. Mm -hmm. Frank Church is a good example. I fully expected people to be mad about that. And uh, there probably were um, people that don't like wilderness. I just, I didn't hear from them yelling. I didn't hear them yelling at me, but it might've offended some people. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't know if that makes sense, but we're no, trying I, to do uh, sort of both of those things in concert. No, I think that, that there's some great sound bites in there. And I think that's an important thing. Anytime anybody's being creative in the space, it's not just about being blanket positive or blanket negative. There's a lot of things that, that kind of need to be said, talked about. And if you want to go into depth, you can. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's something that's, these elements are, are conversations that, that should be had. Um, and then when you are making, you know, whether it be writing or filmmaking or having a business like, where do I want to stand? Do I want to just signal? Do I want to incorporate a little bit? Do I want to touch on stuff? Or do I want to stay totally clear? And that's, it's up to you. There's not a responsibility. There's not a, you know, a mandate or anything like that, that you have to, to have all these things in there. Um, as far as length goes, uh, do you shoot for 15 minutes, 40 minutes or anything like that? Or is it just, uh, I'm going to come home with, or actually, I don't know how many hours of, of film of, of, of footage you come home with, but, uh, how does the story develop lengthwise? Mm, question. Uh, there is a noticeable drop off in people's attention span with longer form content. So we, we generally, we don't set a, a 
time on any one piece of content. Like it's got to hit X amount of time unless there's a very specific reason to do so. Like we're trying to get into a film festival and they won't allow us to make a film above a certain length. Generally though, our rule of thumb is it can be as long as it is good. No fluff, no filler, nothing. And I my rule of thumb is like, does it, does my attention ever start to wander? Mm-hmm. And if it starts to wander at any particular moment, then we, we have to rearrange that section. There's something about that that needs to be fixed. So, but no, we don't necessarily prescribe a length, but I will say that like, if I, I would be lying if I said we aren't fully aware that anything over 25 minutes starts to get too long for most people. But I fully, uh, we're working on a project now, a film project that might go well beyond that. Kind of depends on the content and the story. But we'll see. Mm-hmm. But, but yes, generally, do we pay attention to it? Yes. But we're not, we don't edit to say we've got to hit a certain range of, you know, as long as it is good. Yeah. When you watch a movie, everything is written, everything is scripted, and everything is built in such a way to tell the story. And sometimes movies drag on a little bit, but everything is building to some sort of plot. One of the main parts of a hunt is just that waiting. So it's a it's a weird thing to... I've watched a couple of films where it was 45 minutes, and it was awesome because everything was just... They, they were able to to show that... Sometimes you just have to wait, and sometimes it is a waiting game. But there's enough suspense, there's enough conflict to kind of get things going, so you don't want to skip forward. And I've seen 30 minute films that could have been 10, where it was just, oh, this is boring. And it's again, I don't, I don't really exactly know what it is, but um, you kind of got to go by feel. Like, I, I, I need this to provide context or to help build a story. Versus, this is frivolous. This is redundant. This is too much. It's going to be too long. Yeah, it's that's the magic of the edit, and some people are really good at that. That's where I, you know, Jason, my business partner, he's the magician behind the editing. Um, we do a lot of it together, um, but he's really good at it, and some people are really good at it. But also, as a gut feeling, I know exactly what you're talking about. There are some pieces I've tried to watch that are like an hour over an hour long, and I'm just like, God, this is like. When I get to a scene where, I, if you ever find yourself fast forwarding through a scene, that is a telltale sign that your tension span has wandered mm. or you find it going too slow. And when you're creating content, you should know where those spots are. Yeah. It's super important. Yeah. The YouTube, like whatever tracker thing where you can kind of scroll on the bottom and you can see where, yeah. where people um, stop watching. Do you ever kind of look at that now and think, Oh, well, you know, I should cut this or I should do this or like, no, I like the entire story. That the entire store needs that, so I don't care that it, you know, most people were clicking out after minute eighteen or whatever. Do you look at some of those analytics, and is that to inform <laughs> yeah, your decision? Yeah. <laughs> I look at the analytics. It never, it doesn't inform how we like. I would never retroactively go back and change a piece, but I do pay attention to it. What I have noticed is after you kill something, people stop paying attention. So most people just like watch up to you kill something. They're like, all right, moving on. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when it comes to a film, what, what I take away from that is you have to think of ways to keep the story interesting after the kill. So yes, it informs the edit. So like if in our Frank Church, Last Wild Places film, we kill two animals sort of towards the end, but kind of in the middle. Our drop off rate after that film is, is, uh, not that significant after that, that part of the film because we found a way to, to keep it interesting and keep people around real quickly so Mm -hmm. we actually spent a lot of time on that is thinking through most traditional hunting media they build up to a kill and then they quickly end it that's the traditional standard format we do that sometimes with our episodic content but with our films we try not to have the entire story hinge on that even though it's hard because it's a hunting film Mm -hmm. that is the climax of the story so for for most pieces of content uh so yeah that is a challenge when you're editing for sure. When you talk about episodes and movies too, like you get to the climax and the falling action is pretty short. And then your resolution notes within what five minutes or something like that. It, it has to work on that formula. But as hunters, we know that the climax, it, you, you know, you got that, you got the animal or you didn't, you're heading home. But some of the coolest moments, it's not all just about how horrible the pack out is. A lot of times it is yeah. those moments when you're, you know, you're cooking the heart or you're doing that. It's that, sh- that enjoyment and how that kind of lasts a little bit. And so I don't, 
I think if it, if done right, you can, I wouldn't say drag it out, but you can have some really cool, important shots um, of the going home part, just enjoying uh, in it. And, and it doesn't have to just, uh, uh, to just yeah. end your Frank one was cool because you had the, the drama of the, of the rapids and whatnot, if you're going to, uh, yeah. what, what was going to happen there. And I was, I was, Oh, this is, it's, it looks fun, but, uh, yeah. also kind of, kind of sketchy. It was a little sketchy to be honest with you. Um, and yeah, that's the, the art of the edit. And there, the, unfortunately though, ever, you know, any, any like serious content creator also knows that YouTube essentially penalizes you if people drop off before the last 30 seconds of your film or your content. And so if you, if you have a serious drop off rate, YouTube will like deprioritize your content mm. for that particular piece of content. So it's, it's, uh, in some ways, if it's YouTube is the primary medium by which you're trying to get exposure you have to play by their rules in a bit uh, uh a little bit or else you can't just say uh i'm, I'm an artist i'm gonna do what i want yeah. and like, well you know youtube is in charge and yeah you have to play by their rules yeah um the social media is adds such an interesting element to it too with uh reels and yeah, and absolutely. with uh tick tock reels of uh, or instagram reels of of hunts and whatnot and i think that's such a I don't know how I feel about that. It's kind of a cool little highlight of, of something, but to try to get an entire, I hope hunts don't end up being becoming just this fragmented 20 second hunt type thing. Um, if it's yeah. like a, I don't know, parts there's, there's a, there's a place for that for sure. But, uh, I really hope that people don't turn into just trashy, um, teenage scrolly type, uh, storytelling. <laughs> I hope so. I hope not too. I hope that to me, reels are an opportunity to, to draw people into the longer story. And that's the way we treat them. We're trying to do more. Or we're, we're honestly probably not as great as we could do as we can right now about showing the reels, but um, we're trying to get better about that. Mm -hmm. Jeff. So with all the content that we're going to start releasing, actually, uh, let's see, Thursday today, actually, our first, our first uh, piece of content from last year drops today. Um, we're trying to get better about showing clips from the content as a way reels i should say to uh, engage people and then uh in the in the actual full story yeah you have to be so precise because you don't have much time you got to be really really good and i think people mistake the fact that oh you only have to do you know 30 seconds well that means that if i have a lot of content it's got to be the right 30 seconds or 15 seconds or however long a reel can be you've got to nail it it's got to be good otherwise it's not going to work yeah true so uh, what's next with uh, Argali? What do you got planned for this spring, uh, content-wise, release-wise, hunt-wise? So we're, we are trying to phase, phase release mo more of our content from last year. So we're l just getting ready to release content this week. And we're going to spread out our content kind of throughout the spring, summer, and fall just to try and play around with uh, getting eyeballs on content. One of the, one of the things that I've, I think we've found is that especially in the last like couple of years, there's just a lot, a lot, a lot of content getting released on YouTube, which is uh, good. It's a democratization of hunting content via YouTube, which, is, which again is a good thing. Uh, but some of our content pieces that I really like and think should be get more eyeballs than they, they have. Um, I think it's, we think it's part of that is just timing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to play around sort of the timing of the release of some of our content this year. I, uh, so anyway, so we're going to start, we've got a lot of big game. We had a lot of really good stuff last year that we're going to release this year. And then this year we're really trying to, I don't know, increase about 50% the amount of content that we film. So in the past, it's just been largely been uh, Jason, my business partner and I, uh, in content with a little bit from my brothers and my couple friends uh, of mine. This year, we're going to have uh, uh, my friend uh, Charlie Cronk and uh, my brother Curtis are probably going to have their own content pieces that where they're just by themselves, um, where I won't be in it. Um, they're both, if you've watched any of our content, you know, both of those people have been in our content over the years. And my brother, Curtis, in particular, people always want to see more of him. He's got the big mustache. If you've watched any of our content, people know who he is. <laughs> He's just, he is the kind of person that everybody wants to hunt with and hang out with. Um, why he's such a well-liked 
yeah, this is very, very relatable. So anyway, so we're going to try and film a lot this year. I have a lot of archery hunts this year all over the place and a few uh, rifle hunts, but mostly archery hunts this year. So yeah, that's kind of the plan on the content side of things. Uh, try and do a little bit more. And we're doing this one big, big film project that I mentioned, which is a really personal story for me that we've already started filming this year. We're going to film throughout spring, summer, and then uh, early part of the fall. And I'm really curious to see how that one does because it's it's a it's a little bit it's a hunting film but it's different than anything we've done to date in terms of the story. That's cool. Yeah, like you said, you can only tell your own story, and it's it's all unique. And so what you what you think is probably something that someone else is thinking about, but with your unique angle. So that's cool. Uh, so where can people find you? Where can they watch uh, the archives and, and kind of do some binge watching of, uh, of your stuff and follow you on and look forward to your Instagram reels. <laughs> uh you can find us our, our youtube is just uh our golly official same thing on instagram uh our golly underscore official and you can check out all the all the reels to come for all the people <laughs> that are waiting with faded breath yeah are you gonna go reels and tiktok or just reels i just uh i just reels right now i we we keep talking about doing tiktok and then i keep i just saw something this morning in the news headline that president might ban tiktok and i'm like i don't i don't know I don't know if it's just like good PR for TikTok and it's going to be around or if it's going away. I can't quite tell. Well, it's filtered through the Chinese government, man. And it's just the more stuff <laughs> I read about it. And I'm like, oh, gosh, this is crazy. During my science fiction lit class last semester, we talked about uh, espionage. We talked about all that. We talked about access to our... You know, if, if they make a massive database about all of our interactions and how the Chinese government can influence us and a total rabbit hole with those kids. And some of them were like... Mr. Lund's crazy. He should wear a tinfoil hat. But I was you know, trying to make stuff relatable. So really? I, yeah. I, I, it, it, it's crazy. So, uh, yeah, but, you know, whatever you choose to do. Uh, you didn't have him watch the uh, TV show The Americans. And then uh, oh, the is that the movie. Russian spy one? Yeah. So yeah. good. Yeah. Such a great. <laughs> we we, uh, we read but don't watch 1984 and uh, Fahrenheit 451. And uh, that, that gets them pretty good. But uh, uh, what about the ordering stuff? Where can people go to order the game bags or knives or uh, tents or anything like that? Uh, our website, uh, argaliaoutdoors.com. So they can okay. find that. And that's probably linked up in the Instagram and all that stuff too. Uh, yes. Yep. All all the links all the time on any, any <laughs> social channel you go to. You can find a way to get to our website. Cool. Awesome, yeah. man. Thanks. Appreciate your time. Uh, take care and uh, look forward to seeing what you put out. Thanks, Jeff. Good to chat with you. Yeah, you too. Later.